I like to do this short video, not as in-depth scripturally as I'd like, but I did want to broach this subject that came to me the other day. Uh, a brother of mine was talking about the promises of God to provide for his people at a time when we were discussing the end times, the last days that we're in. And again, for those of you coming into this video, this is a video for Christians only, uh, for born-again Christians only. This is not for atheists or other groups. <clears throat> if you're not a Bible-believing born-again Christian, this is not for you. We were discussing the, the, the end time prophecies and where we are in America and the, the church uh, persecuted in America and around the world. For those of you that know the latest news that uh, uh, roughly one brother in Christ reported a missionary in Vietnam that 7,000 or more of the Hmong people, the Montagnards is the other name we used to call them, the Vietnamese that supported the American war in Vietnam against the North Vietnamese communists had gathered because of the false prophecy of Harold Camping that Jesus was going to return. In spite of Jesus having said in his word as God that he had put it out of his mind and did not know because he was in the flesh, he did not know when he was returning. Only the Father in heaven, the full glory of God, was dwelling on when he would come because no man knows. And that's straight from God. I don't know how you can flip that, but Harold Camping had picked a date. Now, for those of you who don't know Harold Camping, this is not the first time he picked a date. And those people had gathered, and the communists loved that because this is a church in persecution right now as we speak that gets killed or sent to prison. We get Vietnamese Christians who go and infiltrate into other countries, Koreans that sneak in to China to spread the gospel in China and are put in prison and shot or killed, never seen from again in their own countries in North Korea and in China. And they are suffering for Christ. The persecution of the church has never stopped since the disciples were almost all summarily executed, stoned, or killed for other reasons for the gospel. I mean, other methods of being killed for the gospel, such as Peter, who was considered himself unworthy to die on a Roman cross upright, but demanded that he be hung on a cross. If he was going to be hung on a cross, put him upside down because he was unworthy to die as his master, his God, had died uh, on the cross. So, this is my point. The church is under current persecution. And he was saying, but wait a minute. There are all these promises that God was going to provide. And immediately he jumps to the common errors of the 70 disciples of Christ and to this person in biblical history, that person. I said, whoa, 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 brother. Whoa, whoa, stop right there. I said, you're identifying with the wrong crowd. I said, would you have killed Jesus? Well, you know, I... I I guess maybe I would have killed him. I said, yeah, you would have. Because you're a materialistic American raised in that system of materialism here, just as the Jews were looking for Jesus to come back to bring them military victory over their 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 current uh, their contemporary masters which were the Roman Empire which was ruling them with an with not quite with an iron rod but very uncomfortably and they wanted that Roman oppression gone and they wanted material blessing under God. Well, as American Christians, we can say that, you know, we've had it pretty good and we've been material and we've been indoctrinating this country toward materialism. That is material gain, material possessions, uh, money, houses, cars, and all this stuff. I said, we're just as worldly and as, as materialistically focused as the Jews that, 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 that chose Barabbas over Jesus, that said, we reject God, we'll take Barabbas, hang, hang him, hang him. So in, in, in that moment of, of epiphany for him, when he realized that as a worldly man and worldly church, we would be right there with the Jews stoning Jesus at that time, looking for a kingdom and not eternal life. Remember, Jesus came as not the lion of Judah, but the lamb to be slain. And he told them, hey, I've come to lay down my life for the sheep. When I come back, I'll come back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You're looking at Daniel trying to get it out of order and get it all together and get what you want because you want physical gain. And that's the thing I told my brother. I said, wait a minute, you're identifying with the wrong crowd. If you want to identify with the promises, you keep citing the promises. Oh, go out and don't carry money. Don't take a sword. Don't take extra set of clothes. Don't take any food. Go out. Well, that was to the 70 disciples that he gave the commission to go out and don't take money and don't take food and all that and don't take extra clothes. To evangelize during the time that Jesus was here in the flesh bodily talking and teaching. He had not sacrificed. You're not one of them. Hello. You're not one of the 70. 
And if you want to claim other things, like John the Baptist, who lived off honey and wild locusts and was out there, like me, with a red beard, all scraggly and everything. I'm not John the Baptist, folks. John said he wasn't worthy to loose the sandals on his master, Jesus, the Christ, Yeshua, Ho Christos. And I'm not worthy to unloose the latches on the sandals of John the Baptist. I'm not even that good a Christian. I'm the best Christian God can make me when he can get me out of the way. I don't identify with those promises because I am not those people. When Paul went out and shake, shook a snake off him, yes, I have been there when I should be dead. I'm, I'm here and I can bring you witnesses that can tell you that I should have been dead many times. I've walked through the fire. I've been there when I didn't pray, Lord, uh, save me from this, but Lord, let me die quickly. Don't let me suffer. I know I'm going to die, Lord. Je Jesus, just let me die quickly, and that's good enough for me. I'll get to see your face. It'll be all right. Just don't let me suffer. And he says, nope, not time, and pulls me out when there was no escape. So I understand that he has provided for me because this was what he wanted me to do, is to share the gospel with all of you and to teach and preach and edify. And so he would not let me die, but that is that is my provision that he gives. He he says he would never leave us nor forsake us. But in the same breath, he says these are the signs of my coming, the last days. And read the Olivet Discourse, the Mount of Olives lesson. He lays it out. Earthquakes, folks, earthquakes are happening with seven or seven point zero or greater earthquakes are happening every I think it's ten days. Um there's a brother that keeps up with all the, the current things. We're seeing catastrophe after catastrophe after catastrophe, just like we see the ramping up of contractions before the birth of a baby, just like he said. And the church has never stopped being killed for him. There's never been a time in the last 2,000 years that the church of Jesus, the church of God, has been pulled away from the earth. It's always been here. That's one of the problems with Mormon doctrine, that they're saying there was a falling away and they had to come back and restore it. The problem is there's not been a time when there weren't Christians around in the last 2,000 years. So we're already seeing people mass killed for the gospel. We're already seeing the, the, the wound on one of the horns being wounded and take, cut off and then repaired and healed in and, and the, and the, the papacy and, and the, the Catholic Church's leadership in the, in the fulfillment of prophecies. We're seeing suffering now, and people are saying, oh, no, I'm going to get raptured out of here. Don't identify with the wrong crowd. The promises of Jesus was that two sparrows were sold for a farthing, but not one hit the ground, that he didn't know about it. That he took the lilies that don't toil or sow and, or, and adorns them greater than the greatest king on earth. And he, then he says, and of the sparrows, he said, when he finished saying that about the sparrows, he says, no, you're not, you're worth many sparrows. Almost as though it's tongue in cheek, but no, he's saying you're worth many sparrows. Their lives are have meaning. Because you've sinned, they die, but you're worth many of them. Your life's you're a human, you're worth more than them. And I know about that. And he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But he didn't say, Don't do anything. This is the same Jesus that looked at the disciples and gave the prophetic utterance. There comes a day, and I'm paraphrasing here, go back and look it up, when he who hath no script will go back to the house to get his script or purse. And he that has not has not a sword, let him sell his raiment and buy a sword. And then he looked at the disciples and the disciples said, and he said, do you, do you have a sword? And, and he just said, each buy a sword. And they looked at him and there's 12 disciples and they say, well, Lord, we have two. And Jesus says, that will suffice. So we know that he was not speaking of that instance. That was a prophecy of the persecution of the church to all that would come after his death to those men and to the church persecuted from then on, because it is a desire of Satan to destroy the church. And Jesus says that he will not allow Satan to, to, he will allow Satan to conquer the church, but not destroy the church, and that he will come and return as the lion of the tribe of Judah, as the glorious man on the white horse with white raiment, wool whiter than snow, and with the sword of the word of God coming out of his mouth, going to and fro slaying in all, in all directions, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king over David, to, to save his church from Satan. So how do you save a church from Satan if there's no church in there? So if you want to claim that somehow you're to escape judgment or suffering by some promise of Jesus, you have a problem because you're not a Jew that lived in the day of Jesus, number one. Number two, you're not one of the disciples he sent out. Number three, you're not Paul or Titus or Timothy or any other commission like Stephen. So I don't, unless you're in a specific place where God sent you, I don't expect you to get thrown off the roof of a building, land on the ground, get busted all up, and still live through it. 
you're not bulletproof unless God wants you to be bulletproof, unless God tells you, hey, uh, I'm sending you a word of knowledge. You're going to get shot, but you're going to live through it. There have been missionaries who were poisoned by the local villagers, by the shaman of the local village, and didn't die. And the people said, we knew that you were truly the servant of God, because what you didn't know was our medicine man poisoned you, and you ate the food and you didn't die. So we knew that it was a miracle of God, and therefore God was anointing your ministry. He was showing us the anointing of God upon your ministry, so we knew you were telling the truth. So there are times when God provides miraculously, but that's for people doing his work. And here's when I put, I gave him the haymaker. I said, brother, if you're not out preaching the gospel on a full-time basis, giving the gospel to every living person you meet, teaching the brethren in season, out of season, reproving, rebuking, exhorting with all long suffering and sound doctrine, then you don't get to claim these promises because you're not living even at a level of Timothy or those who came after the disciples and after Paul. You're, you're not living to that level. You don't get to claim these extravagant things. And if you were living as good as Paul, what did that get Paul? A Roman execution. A Roman execution to a man who is a mightier Christian than I will ever be. A man who saw Jesus and went blind. And yet we want to claim that somehow the Christian church in America, us poor, set upon, poverty-stricken Americans who in our poverty have more microwave ovens and television sets and air conditioning and refrigeration than any Christian in a third world nation can expect to have. We don't deserve persecution of the judgment of God. We who allow our country's armies to go out and slaughter women and children in Libya, bombing buildings and attacking a sovereign nation without permission. We who permitted our government to do evil atrocities and to torture in our name to kill 50 million plus unborn babies. We, we don't deserve punishment and judgment. In my other video, I point out silence is complicity. Those who do not oppose sin are party to it. If you can't stop a crime or alert the cops to get them to stop a crime when it's being committed, you're party to the crime, folks. And if you're an American citizen, you're the government of the United States of America. And if you let your government agencies that you are the governor over commit sins in your name, then you are a sinner. If you're not out there fighting it, protesting it, and telling your representative, stop sinning, stop doing these evil things in my name, you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. You don't get to identify with the great men and women of God who, for their righteousness and service of God that he bestowed upon them, were almost all executed. The early church gave up their belongings to support the poor and to help the other congregation members to survive, and then they sent out that money to send out missionaries across the known world. And I don't see any of us, hardly any of us, giving up everything we have. And yet we want to claim that somehow we're special. Do not identify with the wrong audience. I always, when people tell me, the, the, the Bible says this, or this is true, or that's true, I always say, show me. Show me. Give me the scripture. And I don't want one verse. <laughs> you know, Give me the whole sentence. What people don't understand in, in hermeneutics, we point out that the, the chapters and verses were completely added later. We did it to make it easy so that we could quote sections of the Bible and, and identify different parts of different books. They tend to break up long sentences because God was a very logical God. The beauty of the New Testament is that it's written in Koine Greek, which is a very powerful logical language, whereas the Old Testament Hebrew is a figurative and poetic and beautiful language with the ability to delineate very fine points of doctrine is in, is in the very first... Uh, verse of the Bible in Hebrew is incredible in what it tells us about the Trinity without mentioning the word Trinity. And he and then and we get to the New Testament where he has to break down and God these atheists say that God is is not a logical and it's not a rational faith, but why does Jesus come to us as a man in his body that he said he created us after that image come to us in his body and in Koine Greek give us logical arguments that he is God and that we should serve him and trust him. It's beautiful language in the in the in the Greek there in the Old Testament. I mean, in the New Testament. But the point of the Greek is, is that when we go look at the Greek, you got to look at those that were long, complex sentences at times. So don't grab one verse out of context. Show me in the Bible where you're supposed to escape judgment and persecution. Just show me where you're supposed to escape persecution. I like that one. Oh, bless God! I would love. I will show you how much persecution I could suffer when I get to leave and don't have to suffer it. 
<laughs> like I tell an anesthesiologist, you'll be amazed the amount of pain I can suffer through when I'm knocked out. <laughs> so if I don't have to be here for persecution, I'll, oh shoot, I'll suffer through all the world's persecution. I'll give me everything. Give me the earthquakes and tornadoes and hail, uh, ten, 100 talent hailstones. Oh Lord, give me all that because if I don't have to be here to suffer through it, let it rain. Show me where you get to escape persecution. Show me where your forerunners, those who shared the gospel with us, those who wrote the gospels, escaped persecution. They were far better Christians than we are today. These were men that saw God bodily, had the faith in him implicitly, and just by speaking the word of God to people and asking God to heal people, God healed them on the, on the spot. Not through their power, but through the power of God, but because their faith was so concrete. They knew what they knew, that they knew that they had seen the face of God. And when they doubted, he gave them further evidence. He raised himself from the dead. Then they knew for sure he was God. And they acted upon that. They went out and they, they healed people through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't see a lot of us healing people. You know, Benny and all those fake guys and those charlatans on TV do a lot of healings. But I, I've been healed personally, but I don't see a lot of healing going on. I, I, I can pray for people and, and people be healed, but I've not prayed for someone on my own and seen them instantly healed through my singular prayer to God. And I can give earnest prayer at times. When I'm in trouble, I can give you real earnest prayer sometimes. But I can't say that I've just prayed for someone and they are instantly healed. I've been healed, but I don't heal. And if I can't heal and I'm not so close to God that my faith is not so strong in Him and my trust is so strong in Him, because remember when I say faith Atheists don't understand what I'm saying, but in my knowledge of him, I have absolute knowledge of God, or not absolute knowledge of God, I have first-hand knowledge of God, and I know that he is who he said, and he's fulfilled all his promises to me thus far, except for those that are future promises. But my, 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 my spirit in me wars, my flesh within me wars against the spirit that is in me, spirit of God, and I'm not as in tune with the Holy Spirit as I want to be and as I need to be, and as I will be in future, to the point that I can literally go and lay hands on someone and ask God to heal him and know that he's going to answer me. Or at least have an answer in my spirit first where the Holy Spirit says, hey, he's not going to be healed. You can ask, but I'm going to tell you I'm not going to heal him. Or where I ask and God says, hey, go pray for this man. I'm going to heal him. You pray for him in front of these people to be healed. I'm not that kind. I'm not that strong a Christian, as strong a Christian as I am to do that. So how in the world do I get to claim that I don't get to face persecution when every better man of God than me before me in the New Testament died and suffered? Only John uh, died of natural causes. E well, everyone else suffered of, of the apostles and disciples, and they were my forebears. And, and they could not claim because Jesus told them, well, how can you, is the, is the servant above his master? <laughs> if you think you don't deserve, look what they did to me. They, 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 have, they have thrashed me and lashed me, and then they, they make me carry my own cross member for my cross through the city, and then they hang me naked in front of the whole world in disgrace and shame, knowing that, you know, a cur cursed is every man that hangs from a tree. And I'm God, the very God that created this entire universe, and they did that to me? And you think that the servant is greater than the master? Don't you know what they will do to you? I'm going to give you grace to go through it, but don't you know what they'll do to you? You're not even the master. So if how can you claim that you're better than Jesus? If you can't really understand what I'm saying, let's take it to the true audience. Are you better than Jesus? If you're better than your master, tell me, because that means you're God. If they did that to him, you know what they're going to do to you. And that means there's no provision that you get to escape it. The early church, even Polycarp, bragged because he was looking forward to facing the lions in Rome. It, to him, it was the red badge of courage to go out and face Roman persecution and die as a, a martyr's death. What is a martyr? Not some guy that straps dynamite to himself and kills himself with people. No, no, no. A martyr is one who witnesses until death. Not death he inflicts on himself. It's witness it unto death, and then he dies because he's killed. And they that was a red badge of courage. There's a special crown, a special reward for the dead who are, 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 are murdered for the, for the cross of Christ, for the gospel. There's a special uh, reward for that. They thought it was great, and then all I hear out of American Christians is we don't deserve it. We want to grab a hold of this pre-trib rapture thing and say that because a 15-year-old girl and the Plymouth Brethren had this vision that we're all supposed to flit up to, up to Jesus to meet Jesus in the clouds when he comes back like angels before the tribulation begins, that all of a sudden we don't have to go through it. Do you know that Corey Ten Boom, that great, Jew, the, that great 
Jewish protector who's uh, her family protected Jews and she was a Christian and they were put in a concentration camp and she had to suffer through it and see her family lost in concentration camps was uh, just disgusted by the uh, the American church who sat the war out for the most part in America not suffering the persecution of the Nazis because they weren't there protecting the Jews and she was like how dare the Christian church in America claim that they don't have to suffer persecution. Persecution's already come. We've watched 16 million plus Jews and Christians slaughtered. And you want to say there's no persecution coming? You want to say this isn't the tribulation? So, again, I want to close with this. Don't identify with the wrong audience. And don't identify as being better than your master. Because if you're going to claim that somehow you're worthy to escape persecution just by assenting knowledge to Jesus the Christ, that he is truly God, that that makes you better than Jesus, that he who was our God, who died a loathsome death, with all the world hating him except for those few followers at the time, and with the shame of the world upon him and with the sin of the world so much that the glory of God had to be turned away from him because it, the glory of God could not behold the sin of the world being for that instant upon the Godhead. If that is what God himself has imposed upon himself, and he told you, he questioned you as a servant greater than the master, how can you therefore claim to be better than your master and be deserving to escape persecution when he, in his righteousness and unworthiness, did not escape the, the blade of evil? And you know that we have to fight the adversary, and that it is his desire to put the blade to all of us. That is the coming thing. And you want to get in these mega churches and act like it's not coming, folks. It's coming. It's coming. If you don't believe me, when you guys vilify those of us who preach the Bible and the United States Constitution because we took an oath to protect the Constitution and to protect your freedoms and, civil, and your protected liberties. Uh, and, and people are saying that we should be put in prison, that we should be shot, that we should be killed for standing up for the United States Constitution, which gives me the right to stand here and address you guys and tell you that Jesus is God, to tell you that Allah has taught that he that Jesus is not Allah. They're, they teach that Jesus is not, a, is not the God, is not Allah. We teach that Jesus is Allah. We do not serve the same God as the Muslims, and I can stand here and tell you that the Muslims are wrong but I will die to defend their right to claim anything that they want about their religion because it's their religion and their right in America because God says, if you don't reject me, I'll let you reject me. If you want to sin and you love me more, I would love sin more than me, I'll let you sin and I'll turn you over to a reprobate mind. I'll let you have it. I'll give it to you until you're sick of it. And if you won't repent then, I'll turn you over to a reprobate mind and make sure you don't repent and I will punish you for it because you hate me. He, the haters of God will not make it. If you hate God, you can't go to heaven. That upsets some atheists because they realize, if there is no God, why do I hate him so bad? And I always ask them that. But this is the, this is the, the conundrum. Don't identify with the wrong audience and don't think you're better than those Christians who went before you that have already been killed and those blessed Hmong who are dead tonight because they were shot up and buried in mass graves and run off into the jungles of Vietnam. Don't think you're any better than the Chinese that are sitting in prison right now. Some of them have been in there for years, living in the most disgusting, filthy, bile prison cells, treated like garbage and filth because they dared to go to China and oppose them and not get into one of these mega churches that's sanctioned by the state, but to declare that Jesus Christ is God. And because he is God, they have the freedom to say that even if it costs them their life. And they are sitting in jail, rotting away in persecution to this day. North Korean prisons. It, Darfur, everybody jumped on Darfur after the poor Christians had been slaughtered. Then they wanted to make it uh, about genocide, and it was about Christians. It was about, Darfur was about the mass murder of Christians by Muslims who would not bow to Muhammad or to Allah. And they said, Jesus is God. We, if you want to kill me, kill me. Jesus is God. And they killed them. So if you... if it, it, if you can't understand that this persecution consists, I mean, is, it persists to this day. If you think you're better than them, you are sorely mistaken. When we sit in air conditioning in the lap of luxury in America with more food than we know what to do with, with electricity and television and air conditioning and refrigeration and bank accounts and gold and silver and automobiles and horses and more garbage than we know what to do with. If you think that that makes you better than some poor Christian that never owned anything but the salvation that God gave him as a free gift that's rotting in a North Korean prison camp waiting to die, 
you're a fool. So I'll leave you with that. If, if you think I'm wrong and you think that you don't deserve judgment, I would love to hear from you. Um, post on this page, Christians only, how it is that you're better than our brethren that have been slaughtered in Darfur and, and uh, other Arabic nations, and how you're better than the brethren in China and those that were slaughtered in Vietnam just this, other, this, this last few weeks, and those in North Korea rotting in prisons, <clears throat> and anywhere in the world where they're facing uh, murder, rape, imprisonment, starvation, and torture. If you can show me that you're better than them and that somehow because you're better than them that you deserve not to suffer for Christ, then I might buy into it. But until then, I see no hope for you to be able to escape the persecution of these days of tribulation and, and use some promise of Jesus to escape it. Show me how you are the audience where Jesus says, hey, you don't have to suffer for me. When he said, take up your cross and follow me. You're going to suffer, but my grace is sufficient. God bless you and keep you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Amen.